on the morning of June 27, 2000, 16-year-old Molly Bish arrived at her job as a lifeguard at Cummins Pond in Warren, Massachusetts. Within minutes, she went missing. Initially, the police treated her disappearance as innocent, but as time passed, they realized that she had likely been abducted. Despite a thorough investigation, there was no sign of Molly or her abductor. Three years later, Molly's remains were found in a wooded area five miles from Cummins Pond. It was now clear that she had been murdered. It's been just over 24 years since Molly was abducted and murdered, and investigators are still searching for the person responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. And each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. So if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use. Okay, so before we talk more about Molly Bish, I want to talk about a couple milestones that passed this last week while I was off. And the first one being, this is the one-year anniversary for Detective Perspective. It's also our 50th episode which is why we've decided to cover Molly Bish, which is a more known case. And I'll get into that in a second. I, I know I'm always thanking you guys, but I really can't say it enough. Thank you so much for the support. I was looking back at the numbers just for YouTube before coming on tonight. And I had this YouTube channel before I started Detective Perspective. It was just kind of like random stuff. And I had around 69, 7,000 people subscribe to my YouTube channel. And within this one year span, we just passed 70,000 subscribers. So to grow that many people in that audience in just that one year period, uh, it means a lot to me. And, and I wouldn't be able to do it without you. I can record as many episodes as I like in as many formats as I like with all these different camera angles. But if nobody's watching or nobody's listening, uh, we just don't get there. So I just want to say thank you so much for the to making it for one year. We almost did an episode every week. We only missed a couple weeks. And uh, uh, to be at 50 episodes and to have over 70,000 subscribers on YouTube, and I think we just passed uh, over a million downloads on audio as well. So just extremely appreciative for all of you out there who tune in every week and show support for me and, more importantly, for these cases. So Molly Bish, this is a case that we decided to cover a couple weeks ago. And doing cases that have been so highly publicized and talked about by so many people, it's a double-edged sword. It's not really what we do here at Detective Perspective. It's more to give a voice to the voiceless, people who, who don't have their cases being covered. I know that mixing in a couple of these more popular cases uh, is something that you guys have requested. And it will also help the channel grow because unfortunately people are searching for Molly Bish. And so cases like that, they get into the algorithm and it'll allow more people to find this, this, this show, which allows us to get the other stories out about these lesser known cases uh, in the eyes and in the ears of more people. So it, it's a strategic move. Uh, it is a very fascinating case. It's from Massachusetts, so not far from me. And it's interesting, and I have to be careful how I tell this story because I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, and I love all the people in this story that I'm going to tell in a second. But knowing I was going to co cover Molly Bish, what happened here was just there's not much you could do as far as nobody did anything wrong to lead to this. But I'm always giving you guys advice on how to better protect yourself and the people you care about. But me and the people that I love in my life, we're not perfect either. And we make mistakes and we're very lucky that none of those mistakes have hurt us in a way where we've lost a loved one like we hear about in some of these episodes. 
So telling this story, and I'm going to leave out names, and, and you may put two and two together, and I will tell you everyone in the story I love very much, but I was at a pool club uh, last weekend, and I was with a bunch of family members and, and friends and, and, some, and a lot of our children, and I was with one child, and another child was kind of out of my peripheral vision, so I said, where's so-and-so? And one of the adults said, oh, they just went to the uh, to the bathroom to change, which was about, I don't know, 20, 30 feet from us. It's in a big public building, a um, lot of people walking around. And you can kind of see into the entryway, but on the other side of our, where we would enter was the exit to get out of this facility. So I didn't lose my temper, but I wasn't happy. And I said, no, someone needs to go with them right now. That can't happen. And there was a conversation after we retrieved that child uh, where I just said, listen, you know, nothing's perfect, but I can give you stories of 10 different parents that if they were sitting here right now, they would tell you the same thing because all it takes is a second where someone who's at this pool area, it all looks like good families and good people, just someone who's not necessarily looking for a victim, but if the opportunity presents it itself, they'll take advantage of it. And I don't want to be one of those stories. So when that happened, I had already had Molly Bish's case on my mind. And so I brought it up at this little gathering that we had. And so I bring it up to you tonight to say, listen, we always have to stay on our guard. I don't want you guys to go out there and be anxious or not go and live your life because of these potential things that could happen. But I'm here to say that I'm human and you're human. And talking about these stories is not only helping the families involved, but I think it it reminds us to be more cognizant of our surroundings and understand that it can happen to anyone. And it allows us to use these stories to educate ourselves on how we can do things better as civilians, as parents, as siblings, whatever your, your situation is. Having these stories, you can almost use it like you would use when you're getting a degree. Seeing history, seeing how other things were done, and applying some methods to your own life to better protect yourself. And it really just drove home the point why we're doing this. So I wanted to bring up this story and I wanted to kind of segue from there into Molly because a lot of you already know this story and that's the other side of the sword. I know coming into this, I'm just going to admit it up front that there are people out there who potentially know this, this case better than me. When you cover a case that's been highly publicized, you are opening yourself up to some more criticism and some of it is warranted where they may say, oh, they, they messed this fact up or they left this out. But the reality is we're not covering this case extensively. We're not doing a multi-part series. I want to get the story out there. I'm going to hit the major facts. But if there's something I mess up or something I miss, please put it down in the comments. Talk about it on the audio versions as well. I want the story to be correct. And if it's something that's egregious, I will make a public statement to correct it. But if it's something minor... Just put it in the comments, let people know, and, and we can keep this story mo moving forward. But I just wanted to put it out there because I think sometimes people think that I'm spending weeks working on this case, trying to solve it from this desk, and that's not what I'm doing. I want to give my perspective on it. I need, I do research it. I have all the notes here, pages of it, just for Molly. And you know, we're going to go through it, and I'm going to do my best. But by no means have I researched this case as well as some others out there, and I'm not pretending that I am. So I just wanted to put that disclaimer out there, but I'm really excited to talk to you about this case because it's fascinating. And I understand why it's been so highly publicized because on the surface, it just seems like such a small window of opportunity where this happened. And there had to be some type of premeditation, but we're going to discuss all of it. We're also going to talk about some of the individuals who've been connected to the story and I'll leave you with my final thoughts and then where you can go if you have information and we can discuss it in the comments below. So with that all out of the way, and I apologize, it was a little longer of an intro tonight, but we had a lot to catch up on. Um, let's dive into this week's case. Molly Ann Bish was born on August 2nd, 1983 to parents John Sr. and Maggie. She grew up in a close-knit family in West Warren, Massachusetts, a small town located in Worcester County, about 70 miles west of Boston. Molly was the youngest of three children, with a sister named Heather and a brother named John Jr. Molly was known for being funny and social. Her family described her as having an amazing ability to make others laugh and a unique sensitivity which made her lovable to all. She was also always there for others, helping in any way she could. 
As a teenager, Molly attended Quaybog Regional High School, where she was an honor roll student and a varsity athlete playing soccer, basketball, and softball. In her free time, Molly loved music, singing, and shopping for shoes. In June of 2000, Molly, now 16 years old, began working as a lifeguard at Cummins Pond, a public swimming area in Warren, Massachusetts. The pond was an isolated spot surrounded by trees known only to locals. On the morning of June 27th, Maggie and Molly drove to Cummins Pond so Molly could begin her eighth day working as a lifeguard. It was also her first day of swimming lessons for children and Molly was looking forward to it. She took her role as a lifeguard seriously and she wanted to make sure all the children were safe. WCVB reported that on the way to the pond, Molly and Maggie stopped at a convenience store. They were seen on the store's security camera at 9.50 a.m. buying water for the day. At around 9.57 a.m., Molly picked up a two-way radio from the Warren police station. The radio served as Molly's only means of communication while at the pond. Just before 10 a.m., Maggie and Molly arrived at the pond, but I want to stop for a second because I have some notes here, and you guys can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but I've heard different times. I've heard they arrived at 9.45 at the pond, I heard they arrived at 9.50, and I've also heard 10 a.m., and so our window where something could have went down, it's anywhere from 3 to 13 minutes, and I'm going to get more into that in a second as far as when the last communication was, but I feel like these times are right, It's which is why I put them in here because they're from security camera footage and her being at the police station, so it could be closer to 3 to 5 minutes, but I've also heard a lot that it was 13 minutes. There was a 13-minute window from the time she arrived to the time she potentially was abducted, so... That's our window. I wanted to give that variant just to cover our bases, but anywhere from 3 to 13 minutes. Again, way down in the comments if you have something more concrete that I missed. Now, when they arrived at the pond, Maggie recalled that the only other car in the parking lot was a dump truck that was depositing sand. Molly got out of the car, grabbed her supplies for the day, and told her mom that she loved her. She then walked towards the pond while Maggie watched, and after the dump truck left the parking lot, Maggie drove away. She never saw her daughter again. Once Molly was at the pond's beach, she set up a chair and took off her shoes. But she never used the radio to let anyone know she had arrived, which was protocol. The police would later say that she was missing by 10.03 a.m. And so this was why I brought it up a couple seconds ago as far as timing. Was it exactly 10.03? How would they know that? Is that why there's a variant as far as how many minutes from the time she was last seen to when she potentially was abducted that could be the variant does it make a huge difference probably not but i'm just trying to be as accurate as possible and as far as the 10 3 a.m i think the reason they're coming up with that time is because of what i just said molly took her job as a lifeguard very seriously and this was only about eight days in so if it was policy and procedure to radio in and molly was the type of person that we knew she was and how seriously she took this job she would have called in as soon as she was on the beach. So the fact that she didn't, I think police are estimating that as soon as she set up her chair and took off her shoes, she was attacked. And that's why she didn't radio in, which is where they're coming up with the, the time of 10.03. Now, 20 minutes later, a woman named Sandra and her children arrived at the pond to swim, but Molly was nowhere to be found. Sandra described the scene to CBS stating, quote, the first aid kit was wide open, backpack was on the beach, her towel was draped over the back of the chair, sandals were in front, the Poland Springs water bottle was right there, but there was no Molly. Molly's red plaid pattern boxing shorts, off-white ribbed tank top, and blue swimsuit weren't there either. Sandra assumed that Molly was nearby with a friend or boyfriend, so she didn't call the police or anyone else. Knowing that the children were showing up for swimming lessons and would need a lifeguard, Sandra grabbed Molly's whistle and took over. After around an hour, Molly still hadn't come back, so Sandra called Molly's boss, Ed, and told him Molly wasn't there. Ed came to the pond, and at around 11.44 a.m., he called the police using the radio. They showed up around 30 minutes later. When the police arrived, they also assumed that Molly was with someone near the pond, so they didn't treat the area like a crime scene. This meant that people were allowed to walk through the area, effectively ruining any potential suspect footprints. The police and other people on scene further compromised potential evidence by doing things like touching Molly's chair, rifling through the first aid kit, 
and using the radio. Okay, so let's stop for a second, and I know what you're thinking. How could they do this? I ask you all to step back for a second and put yourself in the situation. Should they have taken the, the initial call more seriously? Absolutely. But when you first arrive, the number one priority is to find the individual that you're looking for. And there may be something in that surrounding area, like the chair or the first aid kit, where you might find a lead as to where this person is. And that's your number one priority is preservation of life. And there's there's an, a sense of urgency to find this individual as fast as possible. So I have no problem with police going through what they have to see if something will indicate where this person is and who they might be with. You have to make the decision in that moment as a, not a detective, but as a first responder, what is the best choice for the person you're looking for? And at that moment, it's to use what you have to try to figure out what's going on. Is this a serious crime or is it just a, a girl who's walking down the pond with one of her friends? You don't want to have a, a whole crime scene roped off and find out that she had just gone back home because she needed to grab something that she had forgotten. So in that moment, you want to figure out what happened as fast as possible. Now, in hindsight, knowing what happened, yes, I would love to have had the footprints. I would have loved to have the chair, the first aid kit, and the radio not touched by anyone and collected as evidence. And I know, I know in my heart that if the police knew what they were walking into in that moment, they would have done that. So on one hand, yes, I wish it had been properly preserved based on where we are now. On the other hand, I understand that law enforcement and the just the civilians on scene had one priority and one priority alone, which was to find Molly and make sure she was okay. So their heart was in the right place. But critically thinking, it would have been better if they didn't touch anything. But I can tell you right now, if I was the police officer that had shown up and these people are telling me that this girl was here and then she just she just disappeared, my first thought isn't, oh, my God, she's abducted. My first thought is, could she be with her parents? Could she be in the woods? Could she have went to a bathroom? There's a million different scenarios that could have played out other than the worst case situation, which is what we have here. So my top priority when I get there is to find this girl as fast as possible and make sure she's okay. And in doing that, I may contaminate certain things. I don't know if there's any other way to do it. You can't show up and automatically go into it and go, oh, we might have an abduction and murder here. I can't touch anything. Rope it all off. Let's not do anything. Because in that moment, time is of the essence. There were other things that they did do, or I should, I should say didn't do, that I don't agree with, and we will get to that. By 1 p.m., Molly still hadn't shown up at the pond, so the police chief called Maggie, and according to Investigation Discovery, he asked where Molly was, and Maggie said she had dropped her off at work. The chief then let her know that Molly wasn't there. Maggie immediately knew something was wrong. She didn't believe that Molly just walked off to hang out with a friend or someone else. Maggie later told CBS, quote, she would never just leave her job. We knew it. We knew. Molly's parents and siblings rushed to the pond to try to figure out what was going on. When Maggie saw Molly's shoes by the chair, she became distraught. She already knew it was completely out of character for Molly to leave her job, but she definitely wouldn't have gone anywhere without her shoes. Maggie begged the police to take Molly's disappearance seriously. Thankfully, the police listened to Maggie's pleas and called in the state police, who arrived hours later. But the state police didn't think foul play was involved either. Instead, they thought Molly might have drowned in the pond, but Molly's family did not believe that theory. As I mentioned, she was a lifeguard, so clearly a good swimmer, and it would be odd for the person in charge of watching over other swimmers to drown in that same pond. But I will say this, is it possible? Of course it is. She could have been swimming a couple laps before people arrived. She could have gotten stuck on something. She could have gotten a cramp. She could have had some type of medical emergency while she was in the water. So I don't think this theory is completely out of the question, and I wouldn't dismiss it right away. When you have this large body of water, your first thought is, okay, we can't find this individual. Maybe they're in the pond. So I don't completely disagree with the state police's theory here, but it wouldn't be the only theory that I was exploring simultaneously. Yes, she could have drowned in the pond, but she also could have been abducted. So you have to conduct two different investigations at the same time 
Because again, time is of the essence, so you have to go both angles and see where you end up. However, regardless of how the Bish family viewed this theory, state police officers came swarming to the pond and started a full search, still not treating the area like a crime scene. But there was no sign of Molly in the pond, so they searched the nearby woods and again found nothing. And at this point, it was dark out, so they called off the search until the morning. Now, this is the first issue that I want to talk about. I have a problem with this. At this point, based on not finding anything and even before not finding anything in the pond, there should have been roadblocks set up to the, the roads that led away from the pond to stop people and make record of who was leaving the area, who was coming back in. Maybe there's not much you can do with it at that point, but at least you're notating who is in that surrounding vicinity. And also, you can do a cursory search, kind of just a plain view search in the vehicle as you're stopping vehicles and saying, hey, listen, there's a young girl missing. I'm just checking to see, you know, are you from here? What's your business? Where are you heading? And while you're doing that, while you're having that quick interaction, you can take a look in the back seat, see if you see anything that stands out or see if you hear anything uh, while you're stopping that person. Maybe if there is someone in the trunk and they're able to talk, that's the point where they would, knowing uh, law enforcement is outside. So yeah, I would have I would have set up roadblocks for any road leading away from Cummins Pond, and I would have documented everything. And I can guarantee you that almost everybody from that community would have had no problem with the inconvenience of being stopped based on the circumstances. But they didn't do that, and that was a big window for the abductor to get away with Molly without ever being seen by anyone. Now, investigation discovery reported that at around 6 a.m. the next morning, the police held a large-scale search for Molly in the wooded areas and trails around the pond. When there was no sign of Molly anywhere, the police finally believed that foul play could be involved. They started focusing their attention on the main trail near the pond, which had a fork in it. If you went one way, you'd go deeper into the woods, but if you went the other way, you'd go straight to the cemetery, which was on a paved road. The police theorized that someone could have abducted Molly from the pond, then taken her along the trail to the cemetery where their car was waiting. And this is obviously where a roadblock would have been extremely advantageous because the abductor would have had to transport Molly through this trail to the cemetery and then got on the road. And by that time, maybe if it was done immediately, roadblocks would have already been set up around a certain radius based on when she went missing. It would have been further out. And, and you never know, they could have they could have identified Molly's abductor and maybe even saved Molly. But as far as this abduction theory, the police continued building on it and they started wondering if the open first aid kit played a role in Molly's abduction. They thought it was possible that the abductor walked up to Molly, told her he was bleeding and asked if she had a Band-Aid. Then when Molly's back was turned as she looked through the first aid kit, that's when he grabbed her and forced her to walk up the trail and led her to the cemetery where his car was waiting. Sounds pretty plausible to me when you really break it down. More than likely, this abductor wouldn't want to be seen or wouldn't want their vehicle to be seen, so they wouldn't go to the public parking lot. And more than likely, they wouldn't have taken the trail deeper into the woods because that runs the risk of law enforcement finding out that Molly's missing and, and searching that trail and coming across the abductor or, or Molly as well. So the most reasonable explanation here would be to do exactly what they're theorizing. Park your car at the cemetery, walk up the trail to get out of there as fast as possible, put her in the vehicle, and then drive off, and hopefully you're gone before anybody realizes it. So when you're talking about this area and you look at it on the map, there's not a lot of options available to get out of there. This theory, as far as the trail and the cemetery and the paved road, seems the most likely. I don't want to get tunnel vision on it, but what I would say is based on the facts that we do know, the timing in which this incident occurred and the topography of the area, this scenario is highly likely. Now, the state police told Molly's parents about the abduction theory, and Maggie later shared with Investigation Discovery that after getting over the initial shock that her daughter had likely been abducted, Maggie remembered a suspicious man she had seen at the pond the day before Molly disappeared. Maggie said that when she dropped Molly off, she saw a man sitting in a white sedan smoking in the parking lot. Maggie recalled that he glared at her when they made eye contact. Feeling uneasy, Maggie got out of the car and went over to Molly, who was setting up her lifeguard station. 
Maggie told Molly that she didn't realize so many men were going to be around the pond, but Molly shrugged it off and said the guy in the parking lot was probably just a fisherman. Maggie then went back to the car and the man kept glaring at her. Maggie still felt weird and she didn't want to leave Molly, so she appeared busy in the car waiting for the man to leave. Finally, the man left, so Maggie did too, and she didn't think much of the incident until Molly went missing. Maggie described the suspicious man in the car as being a white, heavyset male between the ages of 45 and 55. He had dark colored eyes, dark salt and peppered hair, and a mustache. Now, unfortunately, Maggie couldn't remember the make and model of the white car. After hearing about the suspicious man, the police asked Maggie to work with a sketch artist. In the end, she helped with two sketches, which were released to the public. The police additionally set up a roadblock near the pond to ask if anyone had seen the suspicious man or his car. Now, obviously, I would have liked them to have set up this roadblock immediately, and we may have avoided the situation altogether, but I am still glad that they did this because obviously by talking to members of the community and putting out these descriptions, you may get some new leads. And that's exactly what happened here because by speaking to different people, the police learned of at least two sightings of a white car in the area of the pond on the day of Molly's disappearance. One sighting came from the people in the dump truck who were depositing sand in the pond parking lot. They told police that they had seen a white car at that location just moments before Molly arrived. Another sighting came from a cemetery employee who said they saw a white car at the cemetery around the time Molly went missing. Investigation Discovery reported that at this point, the police believed the man in the white car was involved in Molly's abduction, so they started investigating this lead aggressively, but unfortunately, the sketches fit the descriptions of a lot of different men. As a result, the police received hundreds of tips from people saying the sketch looked like someone they knew. This meant that the police had to investigate many tips, which ended up going nowhere. And obviously, this can be frustrating, but this is just a part of an investigation. We have to start from square one. There's going to be a lot of breadcrumbs. And the reality is many of the leads that we follow up on will lead nowhere. But they're still important because by crossing out those theories one by one, you're deducing the amount of possibilities that are at play. And it can usually take a whole team to do this, but you have to follow every lead if, if not only just to cancel it out. And by doing so, you're hoping that one of these leads, maybe you're even expecting it to go nowhere, you're expecting it to be a dead end, you get a surprise. And all of a sudden, there's a connection to information you already have. So you go to the next step, and there's another connection, and another connection. And that's what you hope for here. That's the dream as the investigator, is to go into this thinking, I don't know where it's going to lead, but as you get further and further along it opens new doors to what could have happened. So yeah, investigations are not like you see on TV. It can be very daunting. It can be very demoralizing and extremely frustrating, but it's part of the job. It's part of what we sign up for. And you just have to know going into it, it's going to take a lot of time and determination to solve some of these cases. We have a lot more to cover. We're only halfway through this episode. Let's take our one and only break and we'll be right back. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. In addition to being thermal regulating, these sheets are also self cleaning. As I mentioned earlier, they're silver infused, which prevents 99.7% of bacterial growth leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. So they're temperature regulating, self-cleaning, and extremely comfortable, I would say luxuriously comfortable, without the high price tag of other luxury brands, and they feel just as nice, if not nicer, than the sheets you'd find at some five-star hotels. These sheets are specifically designed for your skin, so stop sleeping on bacteria, because as we know, bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne, and I can tell you I'm all set with that. So if you want to sleep clean with Miracle, go to TryMiracle.com slash detective to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use my promo code detective at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. And Miracle Made is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. 
So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made by going to trymiracle.com slash detective and use my code detective to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash detective, code detective to treat yourself. Thank you to Miracle Made for sponsoring this episode. Okay, so we're back, and before the break, I was talking about all these sketches and how there were a lot of leads coming in, and because these sketches didn't lead to any specific suspects, the police investigated other angles as well. They tried finding the suspicious man's white car, but that proved to be impossible since Maggie didn't know the make or model. Hoping to find other leads, the police also looked into local sex offenders. They brought many of them in for polygraphs, and the ones who didn't pass with flying colors were added to a list. But unfortunately, this angle didn't lead anywhere either. As the months passed, there weren't any major updates in Molly's case. The state police eventually left the small town of Warren and started investigating the case from their barracks. According to Mass Live, one lead they looked into was the possibility that Molly's abduction was related to the abduction and murder of 10-year-old Holly Peranian, who was abducted in August of 1993 while walking along a country road near her grandparents' house in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, a small town about 13 miles from Warren. Ten weeks later, on October 23rd, Holly's remains were found by a hunter in a wooded area near where she was abducted. The police and locals couldn't help but notice there were similarities between Holly and Molly's cases. Both girls were blonde, of similar age, they were both born in the same year actually, and they both disappeared in a rural area within 15 miles of each other. Now I like what the police did here, this is a formality, they should be doing this. If there are other cases that fit the MO of your current case, you want to look into it to see if there's a possible connection. Do you have a serial killer here? And are there are there similar MOs that may connect back to someone, whether it's a, a vehicle or a sketch of a person or a witness testimony? This is something that's done in every case like this, and, it, and it's, it's standard protocol. You want to talk to sex offenders, you want to talk to people with extensive criminal histories, and you obviously want to look at your other unsolved cases to see if you can recognize a pattern. Now, one person who thought the two cases could be related was a local retired officer named Tim. He had been investigating Holly's murder for quite some time, and when he started looking into Molly's case, he thought there could be a connection, so he decided to dig a little deeper. Knowing that Holly's remains were found by hunters, Tim went to Warren in 2003 and started interviewing hunters to see if they had seen anything possibly related to Molly's disappearance. According to Investigation Discovery, one hunter told Tim that in the fall of 2002, he had been hunting in the Palmer area, which was around five miles from Cummins Pond, when he saw part of a blue swimsuit, but at the time, he didn't think much of it. Tim immediately asked the hunter to take him to the swimsuit, and when they got to the area, it was still there. Tim called the police, and they came to the area and seized the swimsuit, which did look like the same suit that Molly was wearing when she disappeared. The swimsuit was sent off for testing to figure out if it belonged to Molly or not. Unfortunately, the other clothing that Molly was last seen wearing, the red plaid pattern boxing shorts and the off-white ribbed tank top, were not in the area, and as of this recording, these items have never been recovered. While awaiting the results on the swimsuit, the largest search for a missing person in Massachusetts history began. Hundreds of police officers searched the Palmer area, hoping to find other signs of Molly, but it was very difficult to search as the area is densely wooded. Less than a week into the search, the results for the swimsuit came back as a match to Molly. Mass Live reported that the search intensified, and three weeks later on June 3rd, a human arm bone was found on Whiskey Hill in Palmer. In the days following that discovery, a total of 20 bones were located in the same area. On June 9th, it was confirmed that the remains belonged to 16-year-old Molly Bish. Due to the state of Molly's remains, a cause of death could not be determined. However, everyone knew that she had been murdered. Unfortunately, no DNA other than Molly's was found on her remains or the swimsuit. Molly was buried on August 2nd, which would have been her 20th birthday. Her family was obviously overcome with grief. The investigation to Molly's abduction and murder continued, but unfortunately there were few major updates until early 2008 
when the state police received a call from a woman who said that her sister Crystal hinted that her longtime boyfriend Rodney Stanger was connected to Molly's murder. Now, days after this tip was called in, Crystal was found murdered in Rodney's Florida home. When the Massachusetts State Police looked into Rodney, they learned that he fit the profile of the suspect. He lived in Southbridge, Massachusetts, which was 14 miles away from the pond until 2001 when he moved to Florida. At the time of Molly's disappearance, he was known to fish at Cummins Pond and also hunt in the area. On top of that, he also looked a lot like the sketch of the suspect and his family owned a white car. Now, with all of this information, the police went to interview Rodney, but he denied any involvement in Molly's murder. They also searched his home and collected items for testing, but the results have never been released to the public. The police never named Rodney as a suspect in Molly's murder, and he later pleaded guilty to killing his girlfriend and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Now, with that being the case, when I started reading about this, it also brought up something else that I wonder if law enforcement did it. I really hope they did. And that's a photo pack. We know that Maggie drew a couple sketches with a sketch artist, but did they ever put together a photo lineup containing Rodney or any of these other suspects that we're going to talk about to say, hey, we know you drew the sketch, but clearly in your brain, you still remember what this guy looked like. And also the dump truck employees as well. They would remember what he looked like, hopefully. So you take these individuals that come up as suspects as you're doing your investigation and you put them in a photo pack and you show them to Maggie, the dump truck drivers and whoever else potentially saw this person. I ask if they've ever done that. It's one thing to say he's not a suspect or to not name him as a suspect. And in the back of my mind, I wonder if that's because they did do a photo pack and Maggie was able to definitively say, no, that's not the guy. That may be a reason why they never named him as a suspect, or maybe there's a multitude of reasons based on exculpatory evidence that they never released publicly, but were able to definitively rule him out, even though clearly he's not a good guy. Now, there were a few major updates in the case until June of 2017, when private investigator slash cold case consultant Dr. Sarah Stein who had been working with the Bish family since almost the beginning of the case around 2002, 2003, announced that they believed the person who had abducted Molly potentially spent the night at the old sawmill campground, which was approximately three miles from Cummins Pond. Now, while they were there at this campground, they were using ground penetrating radar and they said they quote, found something that which could be the vehicle that was used to transport Molly. Now, Dr. Sarah Stein also wrote the book who took Molly Bish and I was doing some research on her before we're doing this recording. It looks like there's a website called the Stein Institute where she's worked on other cold case investigations. And she seems like a very intelligent woman looking at a couple of the interviews that I could find on her, but I could never find a follow up on this vehicle. So they went to this campground. They used this ground penetrating radar in 2017. And there's a couple news articles and video clips and they said they, they weren't 100% sure it was a car, but they knew there was a disturbance in the soil that was consistent with a, a vehicle. So the theory would be this offender drove to the campground, then buried the car there or left it there, and it, and it, it got filled in with overgrowth or whatever. But I, I couldn't find anything to show me whether or not they went back to this location and dug it up. I would assume that if they did, there would be some news articles on it. I couldn't find anything. And if there had been a vehicle recovered, it definitely would have been newsworthy. So more than likely, they never dug it up. Maybe they couldn't get the resources to do so. Or if they did, it turned out to, to be a nothing burger and, and there was nothing covered on it. But just a little bit more about this vehicle. And I'm going to skip around a little bit. There are the people in the story who later came out and said that potentially the vehicle involved this white car was a 1986 Buick LeSabre. Just something to put out there for you guys in case anyone knows anything out there. And we'll continue on with it, but I just wanted to put that potential make and model out there because it does seem like law enforcement at least believes that may be the vehicle in question. A few more years pass and there's no major announcements in the case until June of 2021, where the Worcester County District Attorney Joseph Early drops a bombshell. He comes out and says that they believe deceased sex offender Francis P. Sumner Sr., who also goes by Frank, was a suspect in Molly's murder. 
Now, Frank Sumner died in 2016, but prior to that, he had lived in the Worcester County, Massachusetts area since 1960. He ran auto repair shops in Spencer, Leicester, and Worcester, and his children once lived in Warren. Frank was a career criminal with a 25-page criminal record, including a 1982 conviction for aggravated rape and kidnapping. Mass Live reported that Frank locked a woman he'd hired to clean his apartment inside the apartment. He then choked her, threatened to kill her, and raped her. He was sentenced to serve 15 to 18 years for the rape and 9 to 10 years for the kidnapping, and that was to be served concurrently. So for anyone who doesn't know what that means, basically he's serving those two sentences together, which means that the most he would do is 18 years because the 9 to 10 years would be done before he reached the 15 to 18 years. Ridiculous. I could do a whole episode on this to think that this man locked this woman in the house, raped her, threatened to kill her, and only got 18 years. That's crazy to me. But then to have these two sentences be concurrent, which basically means the second part of this, the 9 to 10 years, is just a wash. Ridiculous. But different story for a different day. Maybe you feel differently. I think it's awful. So because of this, what I consider ridiculous sentencing, just my opinion, Frank was released on parole in 1998, just two years before Molly disappeared. However, he continued breaking the law up until his death, and when he died in 2016, he was facing criminal charges including failing to register as a sex offender, making threats, disorderly conduct, and harassment. Again, glad we let him back on the street. Now, District Attorney Early did not describe what evidence led him to name Frank as a suspect. Instead, he asked the public for information on Frank's employment practices and personnel, associates, vehicles, travel, and known habits while he was alive. Mass Live reported that after Early named Frank a suspect in Molly's murder, dozens of tips about Frank were called in, some of which were helpful to police. Now, Early did have to clarify, though, that while Frank was a suspect, no one, including Rodney Stanger, had been ruled out. When asked if there were other people of interest in the case, Early said he could not share details because it was part of the investigation, but that his office felt, quote, very comfortable putting Frank's name out. Now, as far as putting Frank Sumner's name out there, it's, it's hard for me to believe that they don't have a lot on him, maybe just circumstantial in nature, but I don't think they would do this all these years later if they weren't pretty confident about it. Doesn't mean they're not wrong, but... If you go back and you watch some of the interviews with, with District Attorney Early, he's asked directly by a reporter, like, do you believe he killed Molly? And he says, some, I, I want to make sure I get it right. He says they have a lot of evidence. And yes, he says, yes, I believe he killed her. And, and if you go look up Frank Sumner, and we'll have it up here too, he, had, he worked at these auto shops, so he had access to a lot of cars. He could have easily had this car, repainted it, dumped it somewhere, kind of put it in rotation at some of the other auto shops. He looks just like the sketch without the, like now, without the mustache in the sketch. But I'll have the sketches up right here and you can see the similarities. In my opinion, he looks a lot like him. So he could have had access to a, a white car. And also, I'm not 100% about this, but I do think that this white 1986 Buick LeSabre may have came from their investigation into Frank. Again, not 100% sure on that, but it was that information was released around the same time. So yeah, I mean, this guy looks good for it. There's definitely some other things that can be done. I had wrote some notes down here as well. You want to talk to his family members, his friends. Did he ever disclose anybody to anything? Was there any type of dying declaration? Uh, was he into fishing? Was he into hunting? Was he someone who frequented Cummins Pond? Did he ever do anything to any children in his family? Sometimes if you go and talk to relatives or siblings or, or children of his, they may come forward later and say, yeah, when I was a child, he molested me, which could display a, a pattern of behavior that wasn't known before. Uh, and then also the photo pack. Like I said, you still have Maggie alive. I'm hoping this dump truck driver is still alive as well. Put him in a photo pack. Show him to Maggie. Show him to the dump truck driver. Do they positively identify him? I guarantee you that face is burned into Maggie's brain. So as we sit here and they feel comfortable coming out, I do wonder if some of those things were already done. Another avenue they need to explore with Frank would be DNA, which is what we're going to talk about next, because believing they had the right suspect in mind, the Massachusetts State Police wanted to test Frank's DNA 
against evidence in Molly's case. But it wasn't that easy. Frank was dead, and his DNA wasn't entered into CODIS, even though he was a registered sex offender. In order to get Frank's DNA, the police traveled to Ohio to obtain DNA from Frank's son, who was serving time in prison as well. Shocker. That DNA was tested against the evidence in Molly's case. The results weren't released to the public, but in September of 2022, Heather, Molly's sister, revealed on TikTok that the results came back showing Frank was not a match for the DNA in Molly's case. She said, quote, it's really disappointing. I am not sure what the state police have on Frank, but I am not going to ask specifically for information on him anymore. I'm going to open up the investigation again to everyone that we've looked at. Heather added that she has lost faith in the Worcester District Attorney and wants the investigation moved to Hampton County, where Molly's remains were found. Early's office responded to Heather's statement by saying, quote, any discussion of evidence or status of DNA evidence being tested is premature and inappropriate at this time. They continued, quote, we have named a person of interest in this case, and he remains a person of interest at this time. Early added that the case was not going to be moved out of Worcester County. Now, I have a couple things to say about this. I don't know what Heather was told, so I'm not going to question her at all. But there is a difference between it not matching and being inconclusive or not enough. And maybe she heard it wasn't a match. Maybe that's directly what she heard. And even if that's what she was told, maybe they worded it wrong. Or maybe she's right and it wasn't a match. But I, I think if it was, they would have come out... And, that being the district attorney's office, they would have come out and said that. So the likelihood is that it was inconclusive or there wasn't enough there. And the reason I, I say that is because in the interviews that I watched with early, he emphasized the fact that they were waiting for DNA technology to catch up to what they did have. And there was a whole video on it, which you, you can go watch. It's right on YouTube where they, the, the reporters got taken inside the state police crime lab where Molly's evidence is being stored in cold storage. And they had a few items, and I, I wrote some of it down here to talk about. So they have soil, the bathing suit, a hair elastic, and a knapsack. Overall, they have 267 pieces of evidence. So even with having this DNA evidence, is it 100% that they're going to solve this case? Absolutely not. From some of the statistics that I've seen, it's anywhere from 25 to 27 percent that you solve cases when you have DNA. So it's better than nothing, but it's it's not concrete. So I do wonder what was said to Heather to make her make this statement and for, to have early come out and still say even after it, we, he's still a person of interest. That makes me believe, based on what I just said he was already saying about waiting for DNA technology to catch up. And the fact that he's still a person of interest, that that's probably the case. There wasn't something that said, because of what we found, Frank cannot be the suspect. And that's, that's what I read between the lines. Now, in June of 2023, 23 years had passed since Molly was abducted and murdered. And at that time, District Attorney Early said that he stood by naming Frank as a suspect. When asked if he felt confident that Frank would be named Molly's killer, Early responded, quote, I'm not ready to say that right now, but a suspect, yes. Person of interest, yes. Clear, persuasive evidence led us to Frank, and we've just got to do a little bit more investigating. Early added that more testing needs to be done to try to link Frank directly to the crime, and that's where my theory comes in that it's not only more testing, but just more advancements in DNA testing to get to where they need to be. Now, in June of 2024, the DA's office released a statement describing how the state police are still actively investigating Molly's case and are determined to bring justice for Molly and her family. The office further revealed that in addition to the 267 pieces of physical evidence I already told you guys about, they also received more than 6,700 leads and tips. They said the police continue to test and retest evidence whenever there is new technology. Now, unfortunately, that's the last update we have in this case. Molly's murder remains unsolved, and her family continues to fight for much-needed answers. Okay, let's dive into this perspective, and it's going to be short because instead of saving everything for the end, I was diving into my perspective throughout the episode, and I want your opinion in the comments below on that because I feel like from some of the comments I've been reading from you guys, you like it better that way, and I don't mind doing it like that. It's probably even easier for me. 
So let me know what you think where I'm kind of breaking up the story with my perspectives on things and then just giving a, a kind of a recap at the end. If you like that more, let me know. If you don't, that's fine too. Also let me know. So I will mention quickly that there's a lot of suspects that have come up in this case over the years and I, I didn't talk about all of them. So there's more you can find. I said at the top of the show, there's a lot of different names that have come out over the years, a lot of different theories. The main ones I talked about was Rodney Stanger. I also didn't mention Gerald Battistoni. He was someone who was kind of tied to this at one point. I also had talked about Holly Peranian in the beginning. They said that there could be a connection there. There has been some more recent information that says a David Pouliot was connected to her case through DNA. He's he's now the person of interest in that, so that's a different person there. And then finally, uh, Francis Sumner Sr., or also known as Frank, and I had mentioned he died in 2016. So talked about some of the suspects, some of the more prevalent suspects in the case that I felt were relative to it. You may have others. Again, that's why we have a forum. You can go on and talk about it down there, and I'll be reading the comments as well. As far as what I think about the case from an overall perspective, what I think you're looking for, the profile here, I think the car is key. I don't know if it's still going to be around. If the suspect was smart, it's been destroyed, it's been dumped in a body of water, or it's buried underground, or it's just been completely dismantled and taken apart. But if you find the car, then you find the suspect, because obviously the car would link back to the registered owner, but that's easier said than done. I know it's like a needle in a haystack at this point, but I just wanted to point it out. We talked about DNA as well. That's still huge in this case. I do think that the district attorney's office has a lot of evidence, has some DNA evidence, and just the technology hasn't caught up yet. Here is a great example of it. Not many years ago, you couldn't get DNA from hair unless there was some type of flesh attached to it. Now they have mitochondrial DNA where they can get a DNA profile from it. So DNA is actively progressing and there's still opportunities to use that DNA evidence that they do have later in this case once the science catches up to what they have. And we see that in a lot of investigations. So I think that's what they're holding out for at this point. Now, as far as the suspect, some of these are obvious. I do believe the suspect had to be a local. They were a hunter or a fisherman. They definitely knew the area, which is why they would know that trail and where it led. I also think this is someone who had been at this area the previous days leading up to Molly's disappearance. This place was cased out and they knew what to expect. We know that Molly had only been there for eight days prior to her disappearance. That's plenty of time. This individual who's ever responsible for it knew that Molly would be there early and more than likely she would be alone. So they set up for this. They were probably already on the property somewhere, maybe the back way, and they were waiting for her to arrive. They probably dropped their car off at the cemetery, walked through the trail, waited for her to come down, waited for Maggie to pull away, waited for the dump truck to pull away, and then they revealed themselves. And more than likely, the theory that the state police laid out as far as uh, this individual approaching her as someone who is injured uh, to kind of lower her guard is more than likely what happened because she's looking down, she's distracted, and that allows this individual to get the drop on her. And that's not speculative. We have the open first aid kit. Why would that be open unless it was somehow involved? As far as criminal history, yes, you would like to think that this person would be a habitual offender and there may be a criminal history associated with them. So you want to look at offenders in the area, especially sex offenders, to see if there's a connection. But I also want to point out that this person could be a first time offender, maybe an only time offender. This was an itch they wanted to scratch. They saw Molly alone in the mornings for whatever reason. They gravitated towards her and they could have carried out this action without ever being responsible for any other incidents. This may have been their first offense. So I don't want to go down that road of in order to find the right person, there has to be a pattern of behavior that led up to this. Yes, that is the norm where there's kind of an evolution, an escalation, maybe starts with small animals or people in their family or their friends and then escalates to a stranger like this. Yes, it could be that. But if we're, if we're totally focusing on that, we could miss the actual person, which may be someone who's just a local to the area, didn't really have this in mind until they saw Molly alone at the beach. And that's where I land as far as what we're potentially looking for in a suspect. And it appears that Frank Sumner may fit that profile. But ultimately, I think that the DA's office is 
still looking for more people to come forward, whether you know Frank Sumner or you know someone else, or maybe you were just in the area and, and there's something now after hearing the case from me or someone else that clicks and you want to come forward. So as always, I'm going to recap right now. On the morning of June 27, 2000, Molly Bish disappeared from Cummins Pond in Warren, Massachusetts, where she was working as a lifeguard. Three years later, her remains were found in the woods of Palmer, about five miles from the pond. Additionally, the police would like to know more information about Francis P. Sumner Sr., who also went by Frank. If you have any information about him or Molly Bish's murder, please call the Worcester District Attorney's anonymous tip line at 508-453-7575, or you can email them at WorcesterDAUnresolved at mass.gov. My final words go out to Molly's family, specifically Maggie, being the last person to see her daughter alive. I can't imagine as a parent what that's like. I've also seen a few interviews from Heather. She seems to really be spearheading a lot of this and, and really trying to find out what happened to her sister. There's nothing I can say whenever I cover these cases that's going to make any difference. All I can tell you is there's a lot of cases out there that I look at and I don't feel as good about them as far as the potential that they could be solved. There's a lot in this case, and there were mistakes made, I know, as far as the crime scene and how it was preserved, but they still have evidence, and they still have a strong person of interest, even a suspect, if you will, and I feel like they are determined to solve this case for Molly and, and for you, but also having the person who's responsible for taking her from you either publicly exposed or, if they're still out there, brought in and held accountable for what they did. Uh, I know many people already know this case. They already know Molly Bish's story. But for those who don't, we are now joining the fight. And if there are any updates in this case, I will bring them to you immediately. As always, I appreciate you guys joining me. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we're a year into it. 50 episodes down. Still many more to go. But until the next one, everyone stay safe out there. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>